Fellas, how we doing? Good, good, good. I was thinking earlier uh, this week about when Katie and I had uh, decided that we were going to be moving here in 2020. There was a time where we had already made the decision, but we were still living back uh, in Nashville, uh, where we were at at the time. It's my hometown. And I just remember, you know, we had made the decision. So now I was just curious, what's life going to be like in Seneca, South Carolina, in the upstate. And so I'm just looking up online one night. I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm just like, what, you know, what are, what are the things to do in Seneca, South Carolina? And when, anytime that somebody would visit Nashville, they'd always be like, all right, what, what do we need to go do? Where do we need to go eat? What are the things to see? And they wouldn't even have to ask me. You could go online. There's going to be some blogs, some top 10 lists. And so I'm thinking, man, there'll be something about the upstate. And it was, it was, a, it was a top 10 list. And number two on the list was to go hang out at the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> and that's when I knew that this was going to be a life-changing move for us. No, one of the things that I came across that was interesting was the Stump House Tunnel. And I showed a picture of the Stump House Tunnel. It was, we used it in the message last week. Uh, but the Stump House Tunnel, it, it was very interesting to me because I'm not from here. And so I didn't just see the tunnel as an attraction. I wanted to read all about it. I started reading. The story's pretty interesting. And some of you may know this story, but if you don't, uh, I think it's a fun story to hear. So here's how the tunnel kind of began. In the 1850s, they had made a decision that they were going to try to create a railway from the Charleston port to the Midwest that could carry things. And so they started this tunnel right up here in Wahala. And a couple years in, there was enough conflict that they actually stopped production on this tunnel. And so it actually sat abandoned for 80 years. This, this tunnel was abandoned for 80 years. Nothing was happening inside of this tunnel uh, during that time. And then randomly, uh, I don't know how somebody discovers this, but in the 1940s, a professor from Clemson figured out that the tunnel created the perfect conditions to cure blue cheese, <laughs> which I mean, I'm like, I'm just, I'm reading this back in Nashville, just thinking like this, are you serious? Like this is, this, they really figured this out and they did. And there was at one point they were curing 2,500 pounds of cheese right there in Wahala in the Stump House Tunnel. And so eventually what they figured out in the 50s is they didn't have to drive from Clemson all the way to Wahala to do this, that they could recreate the conditions. And so they had finished this new facility over at Clemson and they recreated the conditions to be able to cure cheese on site over there. And so the Stump House Tunnel sat again until the 70s where it was made into the tourist attraction that we know it as uh, today where we can go and visit. But I just thought, man, like from being on the outside looking, I was like, this is a fascinating story. It was one of the first things I wanted to see when our family moved here. It's a, it's a fun thing to go check out. Uh, today, we're gonna be concluding a series we've been in called Instructions for Sojourners and Exiles. And what we've done, I've, I've absolutely loved this series. We've, we've opened up Jeremiah chapter 29, which is a letter that God wrote through the prophet Jeremiah to exiles that would have been taken captive from Israel and been living in a pagan nation in Babylon. And so God had the foresight and forethought to have this letter written for them so that when they were there, they would know how are we supposed to operate? How are we supposed to live? Our home's gone. And, and God's saying, hey, I still, I still have good plans for you even in Babylon. And so over the last six weeks, we've, we've looked at the specific instructions that we find in this letter. Let's recap them together. The first instruction that God gave them was to sink some roots and to stay a while, that they were, they were gonna be there. So he told them to build homes. And then we looked at the second instruction to create and multiply. And we talked about how that was both in procreation and in innovation, that God wanted his people to be creative. Then we looked at how they were called to make Babylon better, that they were to work for the peace and prosperity of the place that God had sent them. Even though this wasn't Israel, they weren't supposed to just kind of like insulate or isolate from the city. They were supposed to be involved and help. But instruction four, they needed to keep God in charge, not get confused along the journey about who is really in control. And then we talked about following the right influence, that there's gonna be plenty of false prophets that lead in a wrong direction in Babylon. And then last week, we looked at the most famous verse in Jeremiah 29, and one of the most famous verses in the Bible, Jeremiah 29, 11, where he gives them a hope about the future. There's a light at the end of the tunnel that there would be a day where they wouldn't be in Babylon anymore. But the reality that we took that verse last week and put it in context is that 
they were still gonna be in Babylon for 70 years. And so although there was hope and light at the end of the tunnel, that didn't mean that today was not going to come with its own difficulties. And so last week was about hope for the future. But today, what I want us to see is God actually wanted to infuse them with some hope for today. Because one of the things that Israel might have assumed when they were in Babylon and when they were sent there is they could have gotten that hopeful word, all right, in 70 years, this is gonna be behind us and we'll have a day where we're home and, and, and good again. They could have assumed that that also meant that for 70 years, they were going to be absent of the ability to connect with God. Because in Israel, God had things set up for how they would connect with him. The temple was built as the house of his presence and they had rhythms and rituals that allowed them opportunities to come together there at the temple throughout the year to be able to connect with God. They even had a system of people that would speak to them on God's behalf. And now they're in Babylon. So it would be easy to assume, wow, This is gonna be a long time and we're gonna be away from our creator. We're not gonna be able to connect to God. And so God gives them hope in this instruction to them as we close our series today. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13 says this. It says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. Now, the reason it says in those days is because God gave this letter to Jeremiah before they would have ever been taken captive. So this letter was written ahead of time. This is future instructions when they would have first gotten this. And so he's letting them know, hey, when you get to that point, in those days, when you pray, I will listen. And Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. The final instruction of our series is good news for the Israelites because it's this, instruction seven, you can find God in Babylon. You can find God in Babylon. I know you're gonna be there a while. I know it's 70 years. I know the way that we used to connect is not available anymore, but guess what? I'm not leaving you. Those promises that I've given to those in your ancestry that I don't leave and I don't forsake, I mean it for you as well. You can find me even in the midst of Babylon. If you look for me with your whole heart, you will find me. This was extremely encouraging for them. And I believe, like we've talked about, the New Testament refers to believers of Jesus as sojourners and exiles in our world today. I believe that this instruction is also good news for you and me because it means that you and I can find God in the Babylons of our own life. That there are places that we know are designed for us to find God and connect with God. The places we usually find, the places that are easy to connect with, like being here today, a church on Sunday. Maybe there's experiences that you've been a part of. Those are the places that make sense. I'm gonna gonna find God, but the good news in this is, is God's letting us know we can find him not just on Sunday. God wants you to know that you can find him on Monday and in your everyday life. You can find God in your workplace just as much as you can here on Sunday at church. You can find God in your home and in your marriage just as much as you can in your small group here at the church. You can find God in your school just as much as you can at some worship experience that you go to. God can be found in Babylon. This is a beautiful and encouraging instruction because I don't know if you're like me, but some weeks, I mean, I'm going through the week and I'm like, I just, I need Sunday to get here. (laughs) Like I, I'm ready, I'm ready to be in the presence of God with other people singing this song, good plans. I need the reminder of his good plans. There's days where I'm like longing for it. And the encouragement in this instruction is, hey, you don't have to wait for Sunday. God wants to meet you right where you're at every single day. So that's encouraging. But there's also a challenge, I believe, for you and me as well, because God can be found in Babylon and what God was laying out for them was the reality that while they were in Israel, they had all the tools that they needed to connect with God. They had the temple, which was the house of his presence. They had the rhythm and the schedule that should have allowed them to connect with God. But the tools do not guarantee a connection with God. In fact, Israel had gotten so good about going through the rhythms of their religious activity, but the conditions changed even in the midst of the tools and they stopped connecting with God in Israel. And I just wanna say the challenge for you and I is we can do the very same. 
Like we can go through the rhythm of showing up at church or jumping into a small group or, or worshiping or giving or, or serving. We can do the motions and yet those tools are incredible and they're helpful for us to be in a position to find God, but they do not guarantee conditions that will allow you and I to connect with God. And so the challenge is you could be here today and you could totally miss God. You could totally miss God. And so what I wanna do before we jump in and look at the conditions that God lays out for Israel and that I believe are laid out for you and I of what help us find God in our everyday lives, I wanna pray that God would help us to seek him even today, even right now that we would find God. So would you join me in praying right where you're at? Would you just, would you make a prayer in your own heart? Would you just say this? Hey God, would you help me find you today? I'll just give you a moment to just pray that in your heart. God, would you help me to find you today? Yeah, God, I thank you for your instruction, for your promise that if we seek you with our whole hearts, that we'll find you, that when we pray, you will listen. And so, God, we just, we're we're believing you for those words, that we just prayed, you listened. We're we're choosing to search for you today, God. I pray that we would connect with you today, that, that God, we would find you. We thank you that you want to be found. We love you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, amen. All right, so let's look together at three conditions that would help Israel find God and that really will help you and I find God in our everyday lives. Number one is desire. And the question that I would encourage you to ask is, do you want to find God? Do you want to find God? Desire is a important part of the process. It's an important step. Like if I want this, then I'm gonna choose to look for God, but I gotta want this first. And desire is something that God wants to refine in us and help change the condition of our heart to understand that we should be desiring him because in reality, There is a war going on for your desires and my desires. There is an enemy, Satan, who is doing everything he can to use the desires of your flesh to pull you from the ultimate needs that you really should be desiring with God. He will pull and tug and tempt you in directions to convince you that the things that you temporarily desire right now in the immediate are important enough for you to chase and that can cause you to then miss God because you're not desiring desiring him in the process. Now, Jeremiah warned about this when it came to desire. He said this in Jeremiah 17, nine, he said, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. The enemy is going to play on the flesh desires that we have. And we need to understand that our hearts, they have the ability because they are cursed by sin. They have the ability to deceive us and lead us in directions that are not actually good and not actually best. And Satan has convinced people of this since the beginning of time. It's why sin entered the world is because he plays to our desires and causes us to to really think, hey, do you really want what God says? And Are you sure that you don't want this other option? And and so he'll present this. And it's not only brought sin into the world one individual at a time, but it's it's shaped societies and and, and, and areas of the world. I, I really believe right now our country is really at odds when it comes to morals because we've let Satan really play to our desires. If you look in our country right now, people decide what's good or bad or right or wrong on two questions. The first question they will ask is, well, do I, do I have the desire? Do I want it? And if the answer is yes, if there's a sense of like, man, I feel like I want it, then, then they move to the second question was, well, is it gonna hurt anybody? Like, is me choosing to desire this or stepping in this direction, is it gonna hurt anybody? And if the answer is no, then hey, it's, it's, it's fine, it's good, and I can do it. I'm, I'm exercising what feels right in my heart and it's not hurting anybody else. So what's the big deal? But the problem with this is that we are believing that our desires for our flesh and the things that we want will inform us of right and wrong more than God and what he says is good. We're putting our feelings ahead of what he says and and where he encourages us. And what ends up happening is is our whole hearts kind of get tugged in every direction and, and God God wants us to bring our desires ultimately to him so that he can bring us to him. When we just follow, man, every feeling, we're gonna be led 
directly away from God because there's an enemy who's deceiving you through your heart. God wants us to surrender our hearts and that means that we give him our whole hearts. Jeremiah 29, 13. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I believe that as you and I choose things that our heart deceives us to choose and, and we decide that we know better than God about right and wrong and good and bad, I believe when we do this, we start to not only separate from God, but we experience some of the consequences of those decisions. And when that happens, when things break down in our lives, when things go wrong in our lives, we find that we're in a position where we need God. And I believe God allows us to get into positions. Hear me, hear me real quick. I believe God allows you and I to get into positions where we desperately need God. Because when we figure out that he's who we ultimately need, that then informs that he's actually who we want. I want to say that again. When we find out what we ultimately need, that informs what we actually want. God allowed Israel's, he allowed their departure and lack of faithfulness in their home country to him to naturally lead to the consequences of them losing their nation, just as he told them would happen. And they ended up in Babylon in this pagan nation. They ended up in a desperate spot where they needed God, where they were unsure about their lives, their future, their families, are they safe? They desperately needed God. And God will allow you and I to get into positions where we desperately need him, whether it's a consequence because of our own decisions or a consequence of because someone else's decisions that have affected us, or if it's just because of the curse of sin in our world that's created circumstances, God will allow those things. And it's hard for us to understand, but there's a gift in it that God is allowing us to see what we ultimately need so that we can find wisdom and truth in what we actually want, which is him. A King David experienced this. King David was known as a man after God's own heart. And there was a time in his life where he got sidetracked by what he wanted in the immediate. And, and he committed a sin of adultery and then murder. And his life ends up in desperate need of God. He's running for his life all over again. After, after living a life of integrity for so many years, man, he blows it. And then he's in this desperate moment. And it was from this desperate moment that God reconditioned his heart back to wanting God. And so he penned this psalm that I think is a great psalm for you and I when we're needing to cultivate the desire in our hearts to want God again. Psalm 63 says this, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Like in this earth, it's not satisfying me. He would go on later in this Psalm to say, Lord, your love, your unfailing love is better than life itself. He, he, he said a relationship with you is like better than the richest feast. And David was somebody who experienced the pleasures and power that can come from life that seems to get ahead. I mean, he had power, he had money, he had influence, he, had, he, he was skilled, he had, um, he had wives, he had all the sex he could have wanted. Like this guy had access to anything that his heart's desire could have wanted in any given moment. And yet God allows those things to fall so that David could see what he actually needs. I love what C.S. Lewis says about reorienting our desires. He says, we're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. And I love the way he sums it up here. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. And so God will allow our desires to show us that the places we're chasing, they're gonna fall and they're gonna crumble. In fact, if you read a lot of Jeremiah, 
it talks often about the day that Babylon will fall. And we know in history, Babylon falls. This isn't just a 70 year period where they're away from Israel. Babylon, which is a powerful nation at the time, it ends up falling. And the truth is the Babylons in your world and in my world, our world today, they're going to fall. Every power, every kingdom, every principality is one day going to fall and bow the knee to the one true King, Jesus Christ. Every single power. So wherever it is that we're desiring that's not him, there's going to be a day that that falls and we recognize, wait a minute, Jesus, I needed you. And that's when we recognize that he's what we want. And so desire, it's the first condition. It's the first condition to wanting to find him. I wanna ask you again, do you want to find God today? Do you want to find God in your life? And and if you're struggling with desire, that's okay. Something I like to pray is I like to pray, God, would you help me want to want you? Like, would you help cultivate the desire in my heart? And I might grab Psalm 63 and I might just pray through it and say, God, I don't feel these words. Would you help me to feel these words? Would you help me to want you. Now, when my desire isn't there, my heart's not all the way there. That's where the second condition is really important. Number two, intentionality. The first question was, do you want to find God? The second question here is, what are you willing to do to find him? Like, what are you willing to do to find him? There are days that my heart is not in it. And I've learned throughout my life that sometimes my hands have to go ahead of my heart. Like I have to take a step of action and of discipline just because I trust his good plans. Even if my heart's struggling to believe him for it today, even if my heart's not all the way in it. And this is really true about any area of my life where I need growth or improvement. My hands sometimes have to go ahead of my heart. I think about it with exercise. (laughs) Uh, There are some people who wake up going, man, I just cannot wait to work out or run today. And we know who they are because they post about it every day. (laughs) But then there are the rest of us that we go, oh man, I I don't know. The bed's nice (laughs) this morning and I'm wiped and I'm not sure. And and there are the only way to push that, there's days that we got to put our hands ahead of our hearts. Like our hearts just aren't going to feel it out of the gate. This is true in our budget as well. Like our hearts don't desire to follow a budget that constricts or restricts what we should be spending. That's not what our hearts want. I'd I'd rather spend what I want, when I want, on what I want. That's more fun. And the temptation, like if I follow that desire of my heart, I end up in a hole. I end up in debt. I end up, I'm without freedom. That's not what I actually, what, what I really, sometimes my hands have to go first to restrict me so I can get to a place where I'm actually having some sense of freedom within my budget. I'm not constrained. That's what I really want. I want freedom. I have to put my hands first in the way that I give so that I can break the back of greed in my life. So I can understand like, man, there, there's more to this than just what I, what I get. Like if, if my hands will go first, my heart will catch up to see that God's, God's instructions are good. They're, they're good, they're, they're for my good and for his glory. And the same is true when it comes to our rhythms of seeking him in a relationship. There are times that my hands have to go first. I read something a few years ago that really helped me with this because I, I kind of got confused at one point about why I didn't just have this burning desire to seek God every day, okay? I'm just real talk for a minute. I'm a pastor. I love God. There are plenty of days that I wake up and I just don't have this burning desire that I earnestly search for you. My soul is weary in this land. Like that's just, that's not the honest cry of my heart every single day. Sorry if that's disappointing to you with who I am in your life, but that's a reality of, of, of just things. But I read something, man, it helped me so much. It was just this encouragement that in my life, I needed to be careful to not hunt for an experience with God. See, what what had happened is throughout my life, I had had these moments where I just experienced this incredible moment with God. 
Like it was a, it was a specific Sunday where maybe that song was just, it was, it was hitting right with something that was going on in my life or the sermon or, or the, or the scriptures were just like, wow, it was right on. And it just, man, it just lit my heart. It, it, it just like, I was, I was burning with passion and excitement for God. Or I especially think back to when I was a teenager and I went to like youth camps where we'd be gone for a week and you're away from the norm and you're with friends who are seeking God and you're worshiping God every night and then you're hearing a word. And I would just, I mean, I would burn with passion and excitement for God. That next week when I'd come home from camp, I was so excited, man, God, I'm I'm desiring, I earnestly search for you. And just a few weeks later, it's like that passion, that desire would, would, would start to wane and drop. And it's because I would find that like, man, I'm struggling to have the same experience with God on on my day here on Tuesday that I had while we were all together on Sunday. And so then that discouragement would leave me, well, what's the point? And, and this, this, what I read just really challenged me. I'm, the goal with a relationship with God is not to hunt for some experience. It, it, that's not what the scripture said. Don't search wholeheartedly to have some special experience with God. Just search wholeheartedly for God. Just search wholeheartedly for God. He's a person and this is a relationship and he just wants you to seek him. And at times he will, he will bring an experience that is overwhelming, but there are other days that it is just a Tuesday and it's just great that you're having an ability to talk to God. We don't need to hunt for an experience. We just need to hunt for God. James 4, 8 says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. There are days that that's easier, like a day like this, but then there are days like Monday or like a workplace where nobody else wants God or in a school where you feel outnumbered. There are the Babylons in our world where it's a lot more difficult to be intentional about seeking God. And that's one of the reasons I'm thankful for the scriptures because we actually have some examples of some who were intentional about seeking God in Babylon, even when it cost them. One of those individuals is a, is a guy named Daniel. We've talked about him earlier in the series, but Daniel was continuously intentional about seeking God in his life, even at the point that it would cost him. And there was a time that they had put a law together because they were trying to wipe God out of Babylon, the God of Israel. They wanted God wiped out. And so they said, anyone who chooses to worship or pray to the God of Israel is gonna be thrown into this den of lions. I mean, it's pretty much, it's a death sentence. And Daniel has a choice in that moment. I'm sure his heart felt fear. (laughs) I'm sure the desires of his heart were, I don't really wanna die. I'm not really sure, but but he chose intentionality. God, I'm gonna trust you. You said, if I seek you wholeheartedly in those days, I'll find you and I trust that you're better than anything I'm gonna find here in Babylon. And we see Daniel intentionally seeking God, Daniel 6.10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. With its windows open towards Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day. There's intentionality there. Just as he had always done, sticking to the intentions of what worked at other seasons of his life, giving thanks to God. And if you know the story, God ends up protecting Daniel in that den of lions. It is so important that we're intentional. Not just do you wanna find God, but when that struggle is there that, man, I just don't desire it today. What are you willing to do to find him? Are you gonna put your hands first? So I've shared this before, but just a really practical way in my life that I'm able to be intentional about finding God is I've, I've, I, I just go after these three things. They're on the screen. I, I pick a time, a place, and a plan. And this isn't groundbreaking. This is simple, but this is so important in my life. I guarantee you the seasons that I stopped pursuing God on a regular basis or seeking him in my everyday life, one of those was off. I either finished a plan and I hadn't started a new plan or we had a baby and I hadn't figured out the next time frame or when, how I was gonna fit that in the schedule. And these three have helped me to stay consistent, just like it would if, if, if we were gonna build our friendship, build our relationship. There's gotta be a time. We get it on the calendar. I'm busy, you're busy. We gotta figure out a time that we're both committed. We're gonna hang. And then we're gonna pick a place that we're gonna meet and hang. And if if you're hanging with me, we're probably gonna go to a coffee shop. I love going to coffee shops. We're gonna hang and then we're gonna have a plan. What's the purpose of of us hanging? Are we just getting to know each other? Is there something going on in your life? Is there something that that I I, I sense I need to come and and get your help because there's something going on in my life and like the plan helps. God is a person, this is a relationship. 
I've got a time every single day that I'm shooting for. I've got a place in my house. It's reserved. I bring the coffee. So the coffee's there. Coffee's important. And then I pick a plan. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm not gifted enough to just go aimlessly at this every single day. I've got a Bible reading plan that just, it just helps navigate me because I just, I know I need, I need structure. I need, I need the help. I need intentionality. I need days where my hands go ahead of my heart. Pick a time, pick a place, pick a plan. Do you want to find God? What are you willing to do to find him? We need desire. We need intentionality. But when desire is struggling, and then when intentionality is struggling, this third condition is super important in my life and in yours. Number three, third condition, relationships. Do the people closest to you help you find him? Do the people closest to you help you find him? I've heard this said, and I've found this to be true, especially the older I get and just watch throughout my life and my friends, just the idea that you are the average of your five closest relationships or friendships. You're the average of the five people that are closest to you. And you, this, this, this has been a proven study in many different categories. Like you likely make the amount of money that's about an average of the five people that you're closest with. Uh, your hobbies are an average of the five people that you're closest with. And if you want to level up an area of your life, one of the ways that you need to do that is you need to level up the people that are in your life. As you do that, that's going to, that's going to draw you to up that average, to change things. I've, I've seen this in my life in real practical ways, like as a musician, when I play with musicians that are better than me or more advanced, I grow. I grow because they're, they level me up. I'm learning things as I watch the way they play or listen or ask questions. Like it influences the way I play. And if I play with people that are less advanced than me, maybe I'm helping them, but I'm not necessarily growing in those moments the same way. I, I've seen it in other areas. I've been taking on this new hobby. I've been playing a little pickleball. I know. And uh, I've got a buddy that's really into it. And so he's offered for us to hang and play. And he's trying to help me get better before we go play some real games. He's playing in leagues, in tournaments. He's played a couple of years at this point. And so he, we've been getting together and he, we've been playing this version called Skinny Singles. It's it basically, he's trying to train me and, and help get me better. And every time, like I'm an athlete, so I feel like I'm gonna pick it up pretty quick. I love ping pong. So I thought this would translate. It doesn't super well. Um, and so like, I'm, I'm playing and I'm in, but he's made this statement. He's like, here, here's the deal. Like, we've got to keep working on this because I can't just go feed you to the sharks yet at South Cove. Like, feed me the sharks? What is, and then I'm starting to learn. What he means is he doesn't want me to go get embarrassed by a sweet 75-year-old lady. That's what he means. <laughs> because that's exactly what would happen. I mean, there are people that are really good at this game. And, I'm, and so I'm, I'm just learning. But by playing with him... I'm getting a lot better than if I just started at a beginner level. He's, he's helping me. Every area of your life, you want to level up. You need to level up the people that are around you. And it's, and it's true in our relationship with God. If you want to find God in Babylon, if you want to find God in your everyday life, you need people in your life who are also looking for God in their everyday life. Because by having those relationships, you are going to be able to see ways that they look for God. You're gonna be able to ask questions about what they've learned about God. They are going to pull you in a direction where you will then all of a sudden know, well, here's the intentional steps I could take, or wow, man, that, that's awesome what God just taught them. I want something like that. God, would you do something like, like God, you're, would you shape my desires? Because I want to experience something like that. And the same is true if the five people around you, if the people in your life are not pursuing God at all. It will affect your pursuit of God. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. In a place like Babylon, it's, it's tough, but you need close relationships. And so again, I love scripture. Um, there was a group of friends that were, were paramount for each other in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were able to help each other find God in Babylon, even under the most difficult circumstances. 
There was a moment that they almost lost their lives in a, in a fiery furnace because of their loyalty to God, but they stayed loyal to God because they had each other and God protected them in the process. Do the people that you are closest with in your life help you find God at this point? So just to recap, God's got good news that Israel can find him in Babylon. And there's good news that you and I can find him in our everyday lives. Tools like church and small groups, things like that are, are really helpful because they, they, they have a lot of people who are here today that have brought those conditions to the table. You're being influenced. That's a very good thing. It's an important rhythm in your life. But even being here today doesn't guarantee that you're going to find God. There's conditions that God asks us to bring. We've got to search for him with our whole hearts. Do you want to find God? What are you willing to do to find him? And do you relationships that are closest in your life, are they helping you to find God? I think one of the things that is most encouraging about having a relationship with God is that you and I shouldn't be able to have a relationship with him in the first place. I mean, the first, the first condition that's broken that separates you and I from God is the condition of sin. As soon as we sinned, we forfeited the opportunity to have a relationship with a holy and perfect God. And I think one of the things that's so beautiful about God is not only does he teach Israel that they can have conditions to find him in Babylon, but for us to even have a relationship in the first place, he had to initiate the conditions to begin with. He had to do something about the sin to begin with. And so in the Old Testament, we see him initiate Adam and Eve after they've sinned and start a covenant relationship with them where he provides a sacrifice. And then throughout his people, he calls them to just keep trusting in him. He continues to initiate the relationship. And then in the new covenant, he initiated the relationship with the entire world by sending his son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to change the conditions of our heart if we choose to place our trust in him. And that begins the process of us being able to find God. God initiated the relationship for you to be able to find him. Read this to close from Titus. It's a statement of our faith that one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. He appeared. He initiated. Not because of righteous things we had done but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We have a good God. He wants to be found so much that he initiated the relationship and he's given us instructions of how we can find him in our everyday life life in this journey. I'd love to pray for you before we go. Would you join me in praying? God, I pray that you would help us in these three conditions, that you would give us desires in our heart to really seek you. Remind us that we ultimately need you so that we believe and understand that we actually want you. God, I pray for discipline. I pray for steps of faith and trust that we would be intentional to be willing to look for you tomorrow, even if we don't feel like it. And God, I pray for the relationships in our life that we would, we would observe and think about whether or not the people that are influencing our life are leading us to find you, pulling us away. God, we know we're gonna be surrounded in Babylon by people that don't know you. We know that you want us to be salt and light. We've talked about that in this series, God. But we also need support. And we thank you that you didn't intend for us to do life alone, but to have other brothers and sisters who are looking for you in Babylon. So I just pray, I pray there. And I just would encourage you to just, would you just ask two questions and let God speak to you directly before we leave today? Would you just ask this, like, just, God, what are you saying to me today? 
I'm just gonna give you space, you and God for a moment. God, what are you saying to me today? And the second question would just be, God, what do you want me to do about it? And I would even just ask you that question for you to ponder and think as you're praying. What are you, what are you gonna do about what God is saying to you today? If you're here and you've never received Jesus as your savior, if that's the step that he's letting you know he sent Jesus to die for you and you wanna be saved, you could pray a simple prayer like this. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for my sins. I need a savior. And I believe that you are the son of God and that you rose from the dead. So today I commit to follow you from this moment forward. It's in your name, King Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, this is Pastor Kevin here, the lead pastor of Foothills. I'm so glad that you joined us watching online today, wherever you watch from. I hope that you felt the encouragement and the hope of Jesus today. And I want you to know that we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. You could reach out to us by going online to our website, Foothills. CC, or we would love the opportunity to meet you if you're ever in town and able to come to one of our campuses. Guys, I hope that you have a fantastic week. If you know of somebody who could be encouraged by this message today, be sure and share this with them. We'll see you soon.